Okay, so good morning, um, all of you. Um, uh, it has always been a pleasure to come here um, uh, and share some of the very latest things, um, what we are doing in my group. Uh, I've been here uh, for many years, uh, I think. Uh, and we always try to bring the very latest and greatest things, uh, what we are doing. Um, so in this talk today, uh, mostly I'll be focusing on, not only on big data, but there is a new trend uh, which is coming, deep learning over big data. So that will be something new uh, we'll, we'll try to cover. Uh, of course, uh, there are a lot of things happening on the deep learning, also purely on the MPI side. Uh, that I'll cover in the second talk, uh, which is later today. Uh, but here, we'll try to bring not only the big data, but also the, uh, the deep learning aspect. So these are some like a small cartoons of the big data, as you know. I mean, so we have been talking, a lot of data is being generated, and, and we want to make uh, uh, sense out of it. And at the same time, there is a lot of demand uh, to have the convergence between HPC and big data so that you can run um, both the kind of software stacks on the exactly on the same platform. And I'll try to show you some of the challenges and how we can try to achieve that. And uh, here is also like based on this HPC and convergence with the big data, there is also these days people are talking about high performance data analysis or HPDA. And not only you want to run it on your dedicated systems, but you also want to run it on the, on, on the cloud. So these are some just like uh, uh, numbers uh, people have been predicting, like as we head into 2020, um, you will see that we'll have almost like 40,000 exabytes of data uh, in, in the universe, and then people will be trying to harness uh, all this data and then see um, what is out there. But just to give you a very Quick perspective, uh, this is a very nice slide. Uh, it says like this has been compiled um, based on the 2017 data. Um, as many of you know, like the big data is always characterized by multiple Vs. Uh, so th this is one of the V which stands for velocity. That means the, the rate at which data is coming. That has a lot of impact on how you process because if the rate, data is coming at a certain rate, you have to, your processing rate should match with that. Otherwise, you will not be able to um, sustain that. And uh, just, just like look at some of the, uh, the numbers and you will, uh, like let's say Amazon in every minute in 2017, it was like making quarter million sales every minute uh, of the day. Uh, if you take a look at uh, YouTube, four million videos are being downloaded every minute, okay? Similarly, if you take a Uber, uh, like almost 45,000, 46,000 rides are taking place per minute, okay? So see from all these kind of transactions, how much data is being generated. And there has to be some kind of a data center, software stacks at the back end to, to process all these things. And also make sense out of it so that you can take more decision and then also uh, the appropriate uh, learning aspect uh, if we want to include it. And that is nothing just uh, sticking to internet data, but uh, if you take a look at the traditional scientific domain, uh, exactly similar kind of things are happening. I mean, so we are, uh, heading into very powerful systems. Uh, uh, already 100 petaflop systems are there. Very soon we'll be seeing the coral systems which are 200 to 300 petaflop systems will be coming out. Uh, and uh, yesterday just got the coral two um, announcements were made. So very soon we'll be seeing a lot of machines uh, will be coming. And typically if you take like an application examples like climate modeling, combustion, fusion, astrophysics, bioinformatics, the scientists are very eager to, to run large scale simulations on the supercomputers, dump the data into parallel storage systems, collect experimental observational data, move those data to the analysis site, and also trying to do uh, not only the regular analytics, but you can also carry out visual analytics, okay? So in a integrated manner, you can say that the big data spans both on the internet data as well as scientific data. So we'll consider them in a uh, unified manner. And more interestingly, this is what we are seeing a very nice interaction taking place. Not only we have HPC systems, people are trying to use the HPC systems to process big data. And then once you have some data, people are trying to, to um, use deep learning. And, and the deep learning itself, you see, demands now more HPC, okay? So we're in a very nice uh, cycle here. And this is what I tell my students. So, so if you work in this area, next 20 years, your jobs are secured, okay? Because continuously you'll see more and more demand will be coming to, to design each of these stacks. And uh, not only like people want some kind of a convergence here, but also 
as we have been hearing in some of the talks, there is an increasing need to run these applications also on the cloud, okay, in addition to like uh, running it on the uh, dedicated platform. So how do we achieve that, okay, this, this broad objective? Um, so if you purely take like a big data management and processing in a traditional data center, uh, this is how you will see like in a traditional data center when we interact, typically there is a front end here, there is a back end here, and in the front end here, we typically do the online processing. Okay? So typically these are like memcached, HBase kind of stuff. And in the back end, we try to do the, the offline, which is like the MapReduce, uh, uh, Spark, um, SDFS, et cetera. But now, this is the new paradigm which is emerging, and you will hear more and more about this in the next few years. So what is called is deep learning over big data. Okay? So, so for the time being, many times what happens, you have an HPC system, some people are running deep learning here, some people are running big data applications here, but sometimes you want to also use both. Okay? So this is a typical workflow uh, which is taken, like if you take a Flickr DLML pipeline, this is the website. So, so sometimes you need all these stages, like you want to prepare the data at, at a large scale, so you might be trying to use Hadoop, and then after that, based on the results, you might be trying to run some TensorFlow on, on top of that, which will be a deep learning. And then you may also have some non-deep learning analytics that might be customized uh, in your own uh, work environment, so might be, might be using Apache Spark, and then you might be also like to apply some machine learning model here, which is Apache Storm. So the question is, if you have a workflow like this, obviously you can work on separate machines, but as many of you know in this room, it is not just the computation if you run on the separate machines, you also have to move the data. And that becomes the most expensive operations, no matter like how best uh, kind of power file systems or uh, storage you use, and you lose time on all those things. And not only that, you also lose data locality, okay? So then the question is, okay, can we do it on the exactly on the same system? Okay, so if we can do it on the same systems, so then we'll have better data locality and also efficient resource sharing, sharing and also the solution will be cost effective. So that's the kind of the new paradigm. Uh, we call it like a DLOBD, that means deep learning over, um, over big data. Um, and where these kind of solutions are coming, so these are some examples. Like you see the thing like CAFE on Spark. So CAFE has been there. Earlier, Spark has been there, so now people are trying to merge these things, like Cafe, you want to run it on the Spark. Similarly, TensorFlow on Spark, TensorFrame, Deep Learning 4J, there is a big DL, MML Spark, um, CNTK on Spark, so exactly all these frameworks, whatever you are there, Deep Learning and then the big data, now they are getting merged, okay? But of course, concept-wise, you can do it, but that's, the question is, can we get the performance out or can we get the scalability out? So those are the kind of big challenges uh, facing us as, as a community. So then let's change the gear a little bit and see what is happening in the hardware software side from the purely from HPC and this is the trend we see. I mean, it's not only we have multi-core, many-core processors, um, high performance interconnect like InfiniBand with RDMA has been there in the, in the field now what, for 17 years. We are seeing accelerators uh, like NVIDIA coming and more importantly these days the FPGAs that is coming with a newer revolution kind of things, and you will see a lot of customized solutions will be coming out in the next several years. And the other one which is changing the um, landscape is this NBME SSDs, okay? SSDs has been there, but uh, uh, how many of you are familiar with NBME SSDs? Okay. Some of you. So this is like trying to bring the RDMA concept to the SSDs, okay? Just like earlier, we, a few years back, we saw there was a RDMA was being brought together to the GPU devices so that if they are sitting on the next to each other on the PCI Express, I can move data back to back and forth um, between an InfiniBand device and a GPU device. Same thing is happening now with a SSD device. Um, so you can think of the SSD not, in, not being inside the system but sitting on the PCI Express and a remote node over the network can directly read and write. Okay? So that will change the cost structure of the IO operations and that will have a big impact on, on designing all these different clouds, uh, kinds of HPC and cloud systems. So then this is a network protocol stack. Uh, it's, a, it's a very dense uh, chart, but this reflects all the kinds of activities whatever are taking place in the open fabrics consortium. So that consortium has been there for many years to design all these uh, network protocols and they are being embedded into the 
to the Linux drivers, and then all the other Red Hat, Sushi, and everybody is taking um, um, those drivers uh, from uh, from Open Fabrics. But but the broadly, if you see this this picture, there is a left hand side which is the traditional like a sockets and Ethernet model. Okay, so what it says is if you have an application or middleware written with sockets, so you can go through the standard TCP/IP with Ethernet driver, Ethernet adapter, Ethernet switch. So that is a pure Ethernet domain. Or you can also run it over InfiniBand, which has this IP over IB, TCP IP emulation over InfiniBand. Um, you can do that. Um, or sometimes also you can use the TCP offload engines and some of the um, Ethernet adapter. But, but here you may get some good bandwidth, but you may not get good latency, okay, because of this TCP IP and all these overhead. So when InfiniBand was proposed, this is where like the most of the state of the art things lie. Okay, so, so that means this is the, we are trying to use the remote DMA with user space, infinite adapter, infinite switch, so I will call it as an IB native. Okay, so the right hand side actually gives you the best performance, latency, bandwidth, uh, CPU utilization. But there is a small catch that this application or middleware with sockets cannot directly run there. Okay, so you need some changes because these are all interfaced with the lower layer which is called WERFs. So somewhere your software stack in the hierarchy, you need to make calls to the verbs. That is the bigger difference. And I indicated it's an application slash middleware, so mostly it is the middleware. The middleware, if it gets modified, like from sockets to verbs, then your application can just run transparently. Okay, so that is the whole idea, and then, then you get the, get the good performance. So as some of you might be knowing, I mean, in, in um, my group, we have been working in this uh, infiniband, uh, we started with MPI uh, almost 17 years back on the day one of InfiniBand. Um, I'll talk about that in the second talk. But then as we had the newer kind of MPI libraries um, trying to exploit the RDMA, um, those ideas have gone into a lot of other MPI libraries as well as some parallel file systems. So around six years back, we started looking at this big data field, saying that whatever has happened with respect to let's say MPI libraries, parallel file system libraries, can similar things be applied to the big data, okay? Concept-wise, it's not the same code, but concept-wise, can we have similar kind of designs? So we started asking questions like, what are the major bottlenecks in the data processing framework, like Hadoop, uh, Spark, Memcached, et cetera? Can we alleviate these bottlenecks by taking advantage of the HPC technologies? Uh, especially, can RDM-enabled um, interconnects uh, can, can help here? Also can HPC clusters with high performance storage, like let's say you have a Lustre or GPFS, can they be directly used instead of going through SDFS? Okay. And then if we do these kind of newer designs, how much performance benefits can be achieved? And then also how to design the benchmark. So that was kind of a broad goal we started around six years back. And the objective was to bring HPC and big data processing into a convergent trajectory. So you don't need a separate Hadoop cluster or an HPC cluster, you can try to run both these on the, on the same hardware. So what do we mean by here? So I'll, I'll try to illustrate that concept. So let's say you have a typical HPC cluster. Um, I'm sure all of you are familiar. You might be having some hardware. You might have some resource manager like Turk or Slum. You can have also parallel file system like Lustre and GPFS. So can we achieve, like just like your MPI job is running, can we also have Hadoop job running, Spark job running, deep learning jobs running exactly on the same hardware with same infrastructure? If we can achieve that, so that will be a true convergence in, in the software stack on the same hardware. And I don't need like a separate Hadoop cluster or a deep learning cluster or an HPC cluster, okay? And I'll show that uh, we have actually tried to achieve that uh, um, recently. So to do that, what we came up with a, like a um, um, communication and I/O libraries. Um, so at the bottom, these are the kind of the technologies. You have multi-core, many-core act architecture, accelerator, networking technologies, and all these storage technologies. And we have at the top these big data applications which are typically using this uh, big data middleware, like uh, in the SDFS, MapReduce, HBase, or Spark, or Memcached. And, and if you take a look at this code, you'll see that all this code, the, all the Apache, any version you see, the, the lowest is the sockets. So that's how you call the network, okay, in, in all the stacks. So our first question, was that can we come up with a communication and I/O library so that we at least use some of the protocols and the protocol being RDMA? Okay, can we can we move into that that RDMA protocol? And and once we do those designs, 
Then we try to explore some of the upper level changes because if you go through the, the standard sockets, these stacks were written with slow network in mind. But now if I change those sockets to RDMA, the network operation becomes much more faster. So the question is, can I explore the upper level architecture and see what additional optimizations can be done? Okay, and that's what we are in the current phase. And um, so that we are trying to think of like a co-design cool kind of things. We not only change the lower part, we also change the upper part and then you get a very um, high performance design. And that's what we have done. Like we started the research six years back, but around four years back we started releasing some of the softwares, uh, just like in our MPI project. So this project is called High Performance Big Data, HIBD, the website is here. So you can actually download all these stacks and they are available for not only InfiniBand, also for Rocky, uh, that is the RDMA over converged enhanced Ethernet that is getting a lot of traction. And these stacks also can run on Ethernet, okay? So this is like a superset stack of the Apache. And whatever numbers I'll be trying to show, exactly you should be able to run it on your system using our stack, okay? And then inside, we have like RDMA for Apache Spark, Hadoop 2.x, um, Hadoop 1.x we started with, that we are mostly getting discontinued. We have HBase, MemCast, and similar to API benchmarks, here also we have introduced a lot of high BD benchmarks, okay? So you can evaluate different, different components, like if you just want to evaluate HDFS, if you want to evaluate MemCast, HBase, each one of them, you should be able to compare and contrast different stacks and see how much time each of these operations are taking. This is more for the developers, okay? Trying to see where the time is going and also for sometimes for the end users. So currently this is the user base is around 280 organizations from 34 countries. Um, these are based on voluntary registration. Um, anybody can download if some of you would have visited, we just have a link indicating if your organization would like to be listed, please indicate so. A lot of people download, they don't want to identify themselves, that's okay with us. But this is based on the voluntary registration and around more than 25,000 downloads have happened from this site. So, Originally, these designs were for x86, but now you know, like recently, open power is getting a lot of traction. So we have actually converted this into the open power. Uh, in fact, a few weeks back in the open power summit, um, I presented some of the results. Uh, so it can now run on open power. I'll show some results later on. So in fact, our next release is, um, it will be coming out this, this week. Uh, we are uh, also trying to provide the container support. As you see, I mean, a lot of discussions are happening uh, with respect to containers. So we'll have actually singularity support and also Docker support. So you can actually take our stacks and combine with any applications or something, have a totally like a Docker container, or you can, if you have an HPC system with singularity, you can just run these stacks transparently, okay? So this is like a, just a snapshot of like how the, release time downloads has been increasing uh, steadily over the, uh, over the years. So just to give you a little bit of perspective, like um, each of these releases, what are the features, I'll talk a little bit later, but, but here, this is like the Hadoop distribution. So we have RDMA designs for HDFS, MapReduce, RPC component. We also have HDFS with in-memory configuration. Okay, so, so there is a lot of configuration. If you have systems with a huge amount of memory, you can turn on this in memory. We have RDMA enabled MapReduce. Um, so what we do is like, let's say for example, Apache Hadoop. So the latest release is based on Apache Hadoop 2.8. And we try to make sure that it is compliant. So we are not changing any APIs here. So exactly, if something is running on your Apache Hadoop 2.8.0, this will exactly run on 1.3.0. We, we make sure that in our QA testing process, we validate that. Um, so we are not changing any APIs. It is just the, the lower level um, which is being changed. And, and not only that, I think the, the uh, this where I, I uh, forgot to indicate, we also have a lot of plugins, okay? So for example, like uh, as you know, in the big data field, uh, there are a lot of people use Hortonworth, Cloudera kind of distributions. So if you are using their distribution, you don't have to throw them out. We have plugins for those distributions, so you can just use those plugins so your environment remains intact, nothing major changes, but, but you will get a lot of improvements in terms of performance. Okay. Um, so this is the overall architecture. Um, as I was telling, this is the Apache Hadoop 2.x, so we have RDMA enhanced HDFS, we have a lot of different modes uh, based on your system. It can be configured appropriately. We have RDMA enhanced RPC, RDMA enhanced MapReduce. And top of that, you see here, we have done this integration through PBS and through Slurm. Okay, so these are the two common schedulers are being used most of the time. So just like you submit an MPI job, 
through, through PBS or Slurm, the similarly the Hadoop job can be submitted there. Okay, so that's how we try to bring the, uh, the integration. Same thing we have done with um, Spark. Um, so this has uh, high performance RDMA enhanced designs. Internally, there are a lot of enhanced uh, software architecture, um, off JBM, HIP uh, buffer management. This also has open power. Um, so the latest release is again based on the, the Spark 2.1 um, uh, version. We also have a um, H base, um, as uh, that's like the database of the Apache uh, um, ecosystem. Uh, of course, the, the HBase can run on our RDM enhanced Hadoop, but the HBase itself also we have made it RDM enabled. So you get the double the benefit if you run our RDM HBase with the um, RDM Hadoop. Um, then we have Memcached. Uh, this is a component which gets used in a lot of uh, web uh, 2.0 architecture as with the data centers are becoming very large. Um, so people want to use aggregate memory from all these um, um, uh, the, uh, one of the tiers and then try to use that as a um, big cache. That's why we call it like a cache, just like in the, in the regular uh, processor memory hierarchy, we know L1, L2, L3 kind of cache hierarchy is there. They're trying to bring similar concepts into the data center. So you can try to um, take the aggregate memory and store the results of the previous queries so that if somebody else comes up with another query like that, it can actually get the data from that memcached instead of going to the end database. And I'll show you some results later on. So this also we have done similar kind of uh, enhancements. Uh, not only using the pure memory, we also have a SSD assisted hybrid memory because a lot of these nodes these days don't have memory, you also have SSD. So we think of like L1 and L2. We can think of the main memory, we can use SSD as like equivalent of L2 or L3, and then give you a very large memcached with, with a good uh, response time kind of things. So then we have uh, these micro benchmarks. Uh, I talked here earlier, so you, we have like micro benchmarks for HDFS, memcached, HBase, Spark. So every time we bring some new design, just like what we do in our MPI project, whenever we bring something new, architecture wise, we also have the corresponding micro benchmarks so that you get a feel you should be able to download, play with it, and whatever numbers we show, you should be able to exactly reproduce those things on, on your system. Okay. So then, through this, now you can think how we are trying to bring the convergence. So this is a, you remember earlier I showed this picture. So now what you can do is, let's say you, on your HPC cluster you want to run Hadoop, so download our version, and then it has a lot of configuration. Okay, just like think of it as like an MPI library. If those of you are familiar, MPI typical library has 200, 300 parameters, right? So you typically tune it for a given platform. Similar kind of things you can do here uh, based on how the machine is configured, whether it is a disk, it has nodes have disk or diskless, how much memory you have, if you want to interface with luster. Based on all these things, you can configure and make a module available, just like what happens for the MPI libraries. So then the end users, they don't have to worry about actually building it. They can just submit jobs, okay? So, so through that, we are trying to bring this kind of convergence. You can do it uh, Hadoop, or you can, you can also have a Spark. So exactly on the same platform, um, all the, your people should be able to, to run jobs. And in fact, we have worked exactly like this uh, with uh, San Diego Supercomputing Center. So they are a collaborator in our project. Uh, some of you are familiar in US. Uh, there is an Exceed um, environment which brings all the supercomputing centers together. It is like Prace in, in Europe. Exceed has been there for many years. Um, so if you have an account on that Exceed system, you should be able to run it on, on, on any of these places. So we have worked with uh, SDAC people. So they have actually taken like our RDM Apache Hadoop, Apache Spark. So they're exactly like uh, downloaded, configured, and uh, available here with some examples. And you should be able to just log on and then just submit your jobs, okay? And we have also done similar kind of things. So there is another project called Chameleon Cloud, uh, which is a, a cloud infrastructure for research uh, in US uh, through uh, National Science Foundation. So there we have actually made some of these things as an appliance, okay? Um, so there is an appliance here for, uh, uh, for um, Hadoop, so you should be able to just trigger that appliance and run it uh, with, uh, with your uh, big data job. So with this kind of a background, like our architecture, our things, I'll now go into a little bit more into the details and show some of the designs and some of the numbers, like what kind of benefits you 
will be expecting. So I'll start with some basic designs like uh, HDFS and MapReduce, Spark and Memcached. Uh, I'll also introduce there is a um, Kafka that is coming as like a streaming uh, framework. Um, so I'll show some numbers. Then I'll go into the deep learning. So I'll try to show two things. One is a TensorFlow with gRPC. That's like a, we have accelerated that. And also this deep learning over big data. I indicated the cafe on Spark, TensorFlow on Spark. And then the next thing, I'll try to move finally the cloud support for big data stack. So there I'll try to go into more like a, how you can run some of these stacks on the uh, cloud uh, with container support. I'll also try to show another example. I think uh, Swift, um, OpenStack Swift architecture. So this is an object store. A lot of people are trying to use that in a cloud environment to move data from outside to the inside or of an HPC systems or outside. So that also we have accelerated. So these are the, some of the details um, I'll be trying to show. So this is trying to show like the, we started this project, um, as I was telling almost uh, five years back, this was our first paper at Supercomputing 2012, um, to how do you accelerate HDFS? Because in the Hadoop infrastructure, as you know, the HDFS is the most, uh, HDFS operations are the time consuming part. So the way we try to do, and you will see similar kind of things for other stacks, mostly, in the HDFS, as you know, like the replication, you have to worry about replication. For every block, you need to make some multiple copies, at least three, and this is where you spend the time, okay? So our idea was that can we may change that to RDMA operations, okay? So that was our first thing we started with. So, so we had this JNI interface, so these are the right operations. We took it through our designs, through verbs, um, because these were running with sockets, okay? So instead of sockets, we try to move it over the verbs so that it can run on InfiniBand, IWARP, Rocky, or the RDM-enabled interconnects. So that is the right operation. The read operations or other non-important operations, they still run over sockets. We don't care for that. It's like a, you know, in, in any architecture, you try to always, architecture one one principle is make the common case fast. So that's what we are trying to do. If some other operations are not common, they are not contributing to the overall time, let it go over the sockets. It doesn't matter. Okay, so it's uh, the most of the right operations we take it there. So that was our original design and we have um, enhanced it quite a lot and this is our latest architecture. So here we have multiple modes. Um, so typically in a system you will have um, not only RAM disk, SSDs, hard disk, cluster. So you can actually have different configuration options. Okay, so you can decide where your data sits, whether it's purely in memory or some parts in SSDs or some parts in, um, in luster. So, so we give you a lot of different modes. Um, so based on your configuration, you can actually select. Okay? And, and then we have a policy to efficiently utilize all these storage devices. We have some eviction promotion based uh, uh, data usage pattern. Um, this design was presented in CC Grid, but, but it's available in the, in the code. Similar things what we have done with the MapReduce itself. So that was only the SDFS part. Uh, similar things we have done the MapReduce. Uh, we have brought the in-memory merge. So that means the inside the, the nodes, we use RDMA capability from move to data from one place to the, to the other. So it has like a efficient uh, RDMA-based shuffle, efficient shuffle algorithms, in-memory merge. We have some advanced overlapping schemes, uh, map, shuffle, merge, also shuffle, merge, reduce. Um, the details are in this um, ICS uh, uh, paper. Now, if you take a look at what kind of benefits we can have, I'm, I'm just trying to remain at a high level, just show some designs. We have also RPC-based designs. All the designs are published. If you go to our website, you will be able to take a look. So this is trying to show the latest release. If you download it, what it is trying to show, so this is like a InfiniBand EDR. So the, between these two graphs, we have this, the LO1 is actually the basic stack is running with IP over IP. Okay, and the red lines are with our new RDMA design. So it's exactly the same hardware. We are not changing anything. It is the same EDR cluster, okay? And instead of running the, the basic stack, our enhanced stack, in this case, it's a random writer and Terrazen, and here you will see like you can get a factor of 3x improvement or 4x improvement, okay? So purely the software stack is making this, this difference. Um, similar kind of things here you see like a short, Terra short kind of things. Um, so here you will see uh, you can reduce the sort time by 61% um, or a tera sort you can get 18% um, uh, kind of benefits. Uh, here we are comparing uh, uh, not only the basic stack, um, you might be knowing there is another uh, um, um, 
the stack called Tachyon that has been modified to Alluxio renamed um, Alluxio, so that came from the Spark community um, because Spark also uses HDFS as a back end and they had this Tachyon. Um, so they had that in-memory design because since our design also has the HDFS as an in-memory we are comparing, so here you can see like a Terrazen, we can also have not only benefits compared to IP over IB but also Tachyon um, and, and here by a factor of 2.4 or here like 25 percent of benefit. So then if we go into the Spark, um, we uh, had the first design in 2004 and then we have improved it uh, uh, in uh, 2016. Similar kind of things we have done. So if you, some of you are familiar inside the Spark architecture, um, it has an AT server, uh, NATI client, uh, NIO server, NIO client, we introduced RDMA server and RDMA client there in the, inside the, uh, the, the Spark stack. And then we had the, through the Java native interface, JNI, we put the native RDMA based communication engine so that it can actually work with, uh, with the Infinima and IORF uh, uh, Rocky kind of systems. So if you take a look, um, these are some of the micro benchmarks results uh, in the uh, Spark community. These are the like a sort by or group by uh, those are the kind of operations. So here we are running on like a 1500 cores. Um, and if you see like a, we get almost like a 80% uh, benefit or 74% benefit, like a factor of four or five uh, improvement um, you can see for these operations using the new um, RDM enabled stack. Then this is a high bench page rank. Uh, that is a very uh, common um, uh, benchmarks uh, in evaluating the Spark uh, stacks. Uh, here we see similar kind of things for different data sizes. Uh, these were run on up to 768 cores. This was run with uh, 1,536 cores. Uh, we see again like a 37% or 43% improvement. Okay, so the story is very similar. It is exactly the same hardware. So the, what we are trying to use the optimized software stack, which is RDM enabled together with a lot of some of the other enhancements. As I said, like upper level changes we have done because the network has become faster. We can do some further optimization at the top level to give you this kind of benefits. So then this is like a, uh, from San Diego Supercomputing Center. We have worked with some of the um, applications. So this is like a Kira toolkit. It's a distributed astronomy image processing applications. Even on a very small system, like a 48 cores with 65 gigabytes of data set, overall execution time we can reduce by 21%. Okay, these are very common jobs people run and we are able to accelerate those. And the right hand side, this is like a big DL, uh, that is the distributed deep learning tool uh, using the Apache Spark. Um, so here with a CIFAR 10 data set, as you can see interestingly, if you just use the IP over IB stack, in fact it, it goes the reverse manner. Like it doesn't have the, there's so much communication overhead that it doesn't scale beyond like 24 or 48, but if you use the RDMA, that is the red, we can consistently try to give you the scaling up to 384 cores uh, here. So then recently, um, as I was telling, open power, open power architecture has a lot of threads, um, um, not only more number of cores and threads. Uh, so we have done some optimization. This paper was presented in uh, IEEE Big Data Conference last year. Um, so, so here, of course, there's a basic IP over IB. We had the basic RDMA design runs there. We have done some further optimizations. And then here you can see like a Spark short by the same benchmarks we had earlier, uh, you can get around like a 23.5% benefit. So, so these designs have already been integrated, it's available, so if you have an open power platform, um, you should be able to directly um, utilize our, our stack. So then let me go into the, the two other components like MemCacheD, um, as I indicated, this is like the web 2.0 architecture, so the idea is how we can scale to a large number of clients using a large amount of memory. So here we scaled up to like a 4,000 clients. So it is a very, really large um, environment. And as you can see, um, we are able to, this is an FDR cluster. Uh, it was taken on tax stamp feed. We are able to reduce the latency by a factor of 20 and push the aggregated throughput by a factor of two. Okay, so what it means that if you are a internet service provider and you are trying to design this kind of an environment, exactly using the same hardware, you can now for your end clients, you should be able to reduce the, uh, the uh, response time and also try to handle more number of users. So that definitely brings you like a very uh, good uh, benefits in the total cost of ownership. And then you can um, pass that savings to, to your end users, okay? 
Um, so then we have evaluated this uh, memcached with some uh, online data processing workload, uh, similar kind of things we see uh, compared to IP over IV. If you do a memcached RDMA, um, these are like number of clients increases up to 400 clients. Uh, these are different patterns, read cache, read access pattern. Um, here we can improve the query latency by up to 66% and throughput uh, we can increase by uh, 69%. So then this is the very recent work we have done last year. This is also a part of the release. So what, since we have been working on a lot of HPC environment, we are trying to take a lot of knowledge from HPC to the memcached. And one thing what we have done here, if you think here, it's called non-blocking API. Um, how many in the API world familiar with blocking versus non-blocking? Like send versus I send, as you know, I mean, 10 years back it used to be all send, then gradually things have moved to I send. So that means I can initiate the operation and let the network handle those operations and when I'm trying to do the computation. But now if you take a look at the ones we did all these enhancements to memcached, still we're seeing that we are not really running it in the very high performance. Okay, and then once we analyzed it, we saw that all these calls are blocking calls. So then we said, okay, well, why you need to stick to blocking, which is like a 10 year old technology. Can we introduce non-blocking to the memcached? And that's what we did, like a non-blocking to the memcached API. And, and this is a very dense chart, but you can see like starting from here to, to like a average latency starting from like a 2,200 um, uh, microseconds. So see here, we have, we have brought it very significantly. Okay, so the entire memcached workflow, we have modified uh, instead of blocking APIs, we have brought non-blocking APIs so that um, your operations can be done very fast. And this is also available. This was a IPDPS paper last year and uh, it is also a part of the release, so you can directly go and then uh, try to use that. So this is the Kafka, um, that is a new kind of a streaming framework, uh, which is coming uh, for a message broker. Um, so, so this is in an early stage, we just had a paper uh, presented at the BDCAT, uh, it has not been released. Uh, here you can see like the latency compared to the um, um, IP over IV, we can reduce the latency by 98% um, or increase the throughput by a factor of seven. Okay, so, so we are trying to go through some additional enhancements and this will also be uh, released soon. So then let's move to the, to the deep learning. Um, as many of you know, like the deep learning, there is a, one of the common one is the TensorFlow. Um, that is a common framework a lot of people are using. And uh, that is running over uh, gRPC. Okay, that is the Google RPC, which is the underlying communication framework on which the TensorFlow runs. In our Hadoop uh, project, we had accelerated RPC already. Okay, so we took similar kind of knowledge now to the, to, to the gRPC. So this is a new um, enhanced, you can say it is a, like an um, adaptive uh, framework. Um, so compared to default gRPC, so this is our new design. Um, so you can see consistently we give a benefits like a factor of 2.5 to 2.7 um, X. Uh, and uh, these are some initial numbers um, with a TensorFlow communication um, kind of a mimicking things, uh, so here you can see like we can reduce the latency compared to the IP over IV. This is like the default gRPC, this is the RDMA gRPC, the new design. We can have factor of 3.6 or 3.7 improvement. So this still being worked, I think um, you may see a new release coming out in another month or so, um, so that the entire TensorFlow over gRPC uh, can now also be um, accelerated. So then I, let's move to the deep learning over big data. So I was telling like a cafe on Spark, um, uh, TensorFlow on Spark, so, so this is the new paradigm which is emerging. So if you take a look at the, the stacks, this is what is happening. Like at the bottom we have high performance networks, then you have some distributed file system scheduler, then let's say the Spark is running here, now you want to run Cafe or TensorFlow on top of it. And then you have the deep learning models and algorithms, okay? So this is a much more easier for portability or for running the experiment, but now you can see if you have like a six of these sitting on top of each other, Getting the performance is a big challenge. Portability is good. You can move around your stack, whatever it was, TensorFlow, now put it on the Spark. Spark was running on some platform, now you can actually run. It is good for a, a quick uh, solutions to, to your problem, but then the question is, can you get the performance? And that's what we have been working on. Um, so this is where like trying to compare and contrast, uh, saying let's say you have a file system here, scheduler, the big data framework, deep learning, and of course, these are the HPC uh, technologies. We have not only um, RDMA, the for GPU, we have GPU direct RDMA, then 
CUDA DNN uh, for accelerator GPU. Similarly, we are seeing for multi-core MKL blast kind of things. Um, so here, what we have done now to bring these two stacks together, okay, and that's what we are trying to um, um, accelerate. So this is a solution. If you see again, compared to IP over IV, uh, now the RDMA. Uh, we are able to give you a factor of 2.6 improvement, but uh, main thing people always try to ask anytime you have a deep learning saying, are you getting the same accuracy? Okay, because you, otherwise you can play a lot of tricks and make the things run faster, but if you are sacrificing an accuracy, then that is not the good. So here we are trying to provide a solution so that we can do it faster, but if you see the accuracy, whether it is an IP over IV, RDMA, the accuracy is same. We are not disturbing that accuracy. So your job can run faster. These are some initial numbers we have, uh, CAFE on Spark on the left hand side and TensorFlow on the Spark right hand side. So we have done very systematic, like this is a CIFAR data set, this is a LNET, um, this is a pure GPU using GPU CUDA DNN um, and then these are being scaled to like two GPUs, four GPUs, eight GPUs, 16 GPUs and, and the, uh, for each of these sections we have the left ones are with IP over IB and the right ones are with RDMA. Because for example, if you think our Spark already has the RDMA enabled, okay? So now the TensorFlow with uh, gRPC, instead of going through gRPC, if it goes through the RDMA Spark, then you should be able to extract the benefit, okay? And that's what is being shown here. Um, so you can see like sometimes 13%, 51%, 45% kind of benefits you see if you use our RDMA Spark with, with TensorFlow, okay? So, so that's how you can get the benefit. So then let me try to uh, finish off with the cloud support. So I'll talk two things. One is a virtualization with SR OVA con containers and then the Swift um, work. So, so as such, like as we have been hearing, I mean, so yesterday we had a lot of talks uh, on the um, container and all those things. Um, so that is coming as a newer paradigm, but the question is like, can you maintain the performance? Okay, and uh, I think sometimes I have told this, um, uh, everybody wants, like you want to go to cloud, you also want high performance. So it's a HPC cloud. Uh, you don't want to go into a LPC cloud, like a low performance cloud. No, nobody is excited about that. So, so that's what we are trying to do. Uh, you have a lot of stacks, especially when you run in a virtualized environment, you don't have a lot of knowledge on where your VMs are running, where your containers are running. Those information you lose, okay? Whereas if you are running HPC jobs on dedicated cluster, you know over the years people have come up with a lot of solutions to detect topology. Um, you do topology aware collectives, topology aware communication, so, so that you, you maintain the performance. So we are trying to bring similar kind of knowledge to the container world um, so that uh, here like we have virtualization aware block management, container aware policy extension, map task scheduling policy extension, topology detection module. So those are the modules we are trying to bring back so that when you run it in a um, virtualized environment, you can see like this is our basic RDMA Hadoop. It can run in the container or virtualized environment, but you may lose performance. But if you do this, the enhanced versions, you will be able to maintain um, performance very close to the native hardware. I'll also indicate similar kind of things for the pure API jobs. And finally, let me touch this uh, Swift object store. So how many of you are familiar with this OpenStack Swift? Okay. Uh, do you use that in your environment? So, okay. So, so this is a typical um, um, environment. Uh, this is the Swift. Uh, the way it basically it is a put and get kind of operation. Uh, it is a um, deployed as a part of the OpenStack. Uh, can be deployed also standalone. So these are operations that are typically HTTP based. And uh, the traditional Swift stack again uses the TCP sockets, TCP IP sockets as the um, as the lower module. So we started this project saying, can RDMA help here, okay? Um, so we have this paper which was presented at CC Grid uh, last year. So we have done two kinds of designs. Uh, one is a client oblivious design. So that means the client, always you know, like these are the object servers, then there is a proxy server here. That is a typical uh, um, architecture. So we introduced a D1 which is client oblivious so that the client talks to the proxy server using the standard thing so that we are not changing. But from proxy server to object store, so we changed all this to RDMA. Instead of send receives, those are like the blue uh, or a TCP, uh, we changed to RDMA. But then there was a more advanced design, which is like the D2. So where we have like even the client talking to the proxy server also is RDMA enabled. Okay, so that means if you have flexibility to, to modify your clients, you can go through this or if you don't want, you, you can stay here. So we call it like a Swift X 
And uh, so if you take a look at some of the benefits, uh, what, what you can see, um, so this is like a time break off for the gate operation and then the, uh, the gate operation here and put operation here. And the right hand side is the latency. Um, so the basic sweep, especially for large data transfer, and that's what happens in these kind of environments, you can like for a four gigabytes transfer, your latency, gate latency can be reduced by 66% uh, kind of things using this, uh, this RDMA design. Uh, even for put also, you can get like a 3.8x. So this is the very latest, uh, this is still being worked out. Um, these are the first results. We are trying to optimize it further. Again, you will see there will be a release coming out on, on this so that you can help uh, all those uh, Swift users. So with this, let me conclude here. Um, what I discussed, some of the challenges in accelerating big data and also the deploying stacks. I presented some of the designs which show the benefits and it can actually, these are very promising for big data processing as well as the associated deep learning. And if we can take advantage of some of these advanced designs, uh, we can actually get the true convergence, what, what the community is talking about between HPC, big data, and deep learning. Okay. So with this, let me stop here. And then um, I have another talk uh, uh, at 11.45 that will go into more into the pure HPC, deep learning, and, and cloud. Um, and I just want to thank all our sponsors, but more importantly, these are all my heroes. Uh, they do all the hard work. I just come and present. Um, so I always want to acknowledge uh, these people. And I just want to finally indicate this. So we have been doing, uh, leading a workshop called High Performance Big Data Computing, called HPBDC. It has been going for several years. Uh, it is get done together with IPDPS, uh, the conference, uh, uh, which will be held next month in Vancouver. So we have a very good program here. Uh, we'll have a keynote talk by Professor Jeffrey Fox. We have papers. We also have a panel uh, which says which framework is the best for high performance deep learning. Either you go through a big data or go through the HPC kind of things. Um, so I just want to indicate that if some of you are attending the IPDPS uh, conference, so please feel free to uh, join us. So with this, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. If there are quick questions, I'll be able to take it now. Otherwise, we can talk offline.